Welcome to Matters Financial and Geopolitical from a Frontier Trust, a uh, great weekend. My older daughters came back from England and from their first term of university, so we all got up very early on Saturday morning, got down to the airport and picked them up, and uh, the house was a lot more lively, um, with some teenage girls around, I must admit. It's good to have them back. Home thoughts. Uh, I read Paul Theroux over the weekend, and. Uh, if you've never read The Lower River, then you must. And it's a remarkably good book. Plays out, uh, he's an American, he came out to Malawi, and I know Malawi because my wife's from there. He came out to Malawi, was part of the Peace Corps when he was in his 20s, and had a very idyllic uh, time there. And he's worked all his life in America. He's going through a messy divorce, and he decides to revisit the same place he visited all those years ago, and it's in a very remote part of Malawi. And he goes in there um, with all these ambitions, and it's a little bit like the servant with Dirk Bogart. Things start to go horribly wrong. Very powerful, read it in one sitting. Gong Hills this evening was a photograph by Kenyan Fax. I can see the Gong Hills from my window, actually. And it took me back to Karen Blixen. If I know a song of Africa, of the giraffe and the African new moon lying on her back, of the plows and the fields and the sweaty faces, of the coffee pickets, does Africa know a song of me? Will the air over the plain quiver with a colour that I have had on? or the children invent a game in which my name is or the full moon throw a shadow over the gravel of the drive that was like me or will the eagles of the gong hills look out for me couldn't resist this photograph i came across in the early morning as i was getting ready last night at the square holiday party the lady and i took our holiday card photo Happy holidays, you all. Look and see, a very happy photograph. I like this from Bibson Tells. You're just a background character in seven billion different stories, while being the main character in a story with seven billion background characters. Mario Vargas Llosa, if I didn't write, I would blow my brains out without a shadow of doubt. And the final home thought, sculptors like Bernini in the 1600s captured such intense detail and texture in solid marble. This makes my brain hurt. Political Reflections on September the 11th, 1977. Steve Biko was transported in the back of a police Land Rover to Pretoria Central Prison, naked in chains. He said many things, and he was a totemic freedom fighter. You are either alive and proud, or you are dead. And when you are dead, you can't care anyway. Put up a photograph of Syrian President Bashar Assad and his wife Asma Assad. And my piece over the weekend was the meaning of Aleppo. Aleppo is an ancient metropolis, and according to Wikipedia, one of the oldest continuously inhabited cities of the world. It may have been inhabited since the 6th millennium BC. Such a long history is attributed to its strategic location as a trading center midway between the Mediterranean Sea and Mesopotamia, modern Iraq. Aleppo was always a mosaic of peoples and religions with Muslims, Christians, and a large Armenian community, a symbol of a secular Syria, and probably informs us why it became such a potent symbol for the jihadists, many of whom were ported straight out of Benghazi. The importance of Syria as President Bashar al-Assad's victory cannot be gainsaid. Of course, it is not only the optometrist president's victory, but also victory for Russia's Vladimir Putin and for Iran's Syed Ali Khamenei. And of course, I've forgotten my article, but Hezbollah 
played an equal role to Russia and Iran. President Assad would surely have been a footnote, just like former Libyan ruler Muammar Gaddafi, of whom Hillary Clinton said, we came, we saw, he died. The Arab Spring started in Tunisia as the Jasmine Revolution with the self-immolation of the 26-year-old Mohammed Bouazizi. However, in a Rumsfeldian move, you will recall Rumsfeld said this after 9-11, hard to get good case, need to move swiftly. The notes say near-term target needs, go massive, sweep it all up, things related and not. Western powers saw an opportunity to topple Gaddafi and Bashar. Aleppo is where the regime change agenda was stopped in its tracks. This is the first and overarching point. Of course, the price that has been paid by ordinary Syrians to achieve this has been off the charts. The hand-wringing and grandstanding out of the likes of Ambassador Power is not correlated to their sense of tragedy about the lives lost, but entirely correlated to the geopolitical import of Aleppo. Proxy assets have been annihilated or are about to be, and remember, the last thing the owners of the proxies want is that the head choppers come home to Riyadh, Doha and Istanbul. As flies to wanted boys are we to the gods, they kill us for their sport. The proxies will be dispensed with on Syrian soil because if they ever do go home, then we will really have an Arab Spring, not one that was manufactured. The propaganda that was the white helmets, that was the idea that a bunch of Wahhabist head choppers were going to bring democracy to Syria, has been exposed and is particularly poor in the comparison with, for example, Russian interference in the US election which was non-linear and seriously sophisticated. President Assad, who was once hanging on in Damascus by his fingertips, has seen off former British Prime Minister David Cameron, US President Barack Obama, Italy's PM Matteo Renzi, and the single-digit popularity of President Francois Hollande of France. German Chancellor Angela Merkel is now surrounded on all sides in Europe. President Abdel Fattah al-Sisi of Egypt has seen the way the wind is blowing and has skedaddled into the Russia-Iran axis. Aleppo is the moment when the trend changed and Russia and Iran are now in the ascendancy and those in their palaces in Riyadh, Doha and Istanbul need to appreciate how fluid this moment is and how exposed they are now. Let me leave you with the poem Ozymandias by Shelley. I met a traveller from an antique land who said two vast and trunkless legs of stone stand in the desert, near them on the sand half sunk, a shattered visage lies whose frown and wrinkled lip and sneer of cold command tell that its sculptor well those passion passions read which yet survive, stamped on these lifeless things, the hand that mocked them, and the heart that fed. And on the pedestal these words appear, My name is Ozymandias, King of Kings. Look on my works, ye mighty, and despair. Nothing beside remains. Round the decay of that colossal wreck, boundless and bare, the lone and level sand, stretch far away. And I asked, and who will be Ozymandias? I found this, the beautiful Aleppo room, 1600 to 1601, now in Berlin's Museum of Islamic Art. A colossal basalt lion statue found at the Ain Dara temple near Aleppo, Syria, 10th to the 8th century BC. Evacuations from Aleppo's, Aleppo postponed until further notice on off. Um, Bernard Henri Levy, one of the big cheerleaders, the regime changers who have been stopped dead in their tracks by Aleppo, um, tweeted, Ne rien pour Poutine qu'un théâtre parmi d'autres de son nazisme furieux. It's implying that Aleppo 
is the stage for his furious narcissism. As Trump tweets, China quietly weighs options to retaliate. China's leaders are biting their tongues as US President-elect Donald Trump uses Twitter to rattle relations between the world's biggest economies. Trump lashed out at China over the weekend, saying it stole an underwater drone from the US Navy in an unprecedented act. Beijing's response was muted. Uh, the Global Times mocked his demeanor as lagging far behind the White House spokespersons. China has so far practiced restraint of Trump's provocations as he's yet to enter the White House, the Global Times said. But this attitude won't last long after he officially becomes the US president, where he was still to treat China in the manner he tweeted today. It just shows that Trump hasn't thought out his policy before he tweets it, Davis said. The risk is that he's going to confront China to the point where it is destabilizing. 14th of November, when I said here comes President Trump, I also said, as Trump has indicated, China is the main adversary. And that the US was seeking, you know, this Trump had indicated China's the main adversary, and it's difficult to understand why the US was seeking to send Putin into Z and Pink's ready embrace. And therefore, I think Trump, to triangulate China, he's, he obviously has made the decision to get Russia on his side and not on China's. This is a serious business, Senator John McCain says Russian election related hacks threaten to destroy democracy. 5th of December, I spoke about how Russia ran a seriously sophisticated program of interference, mostly digital. We have a deviant tomahawk. We copy, there's a voice, we have gross oscillation here, there's some interference. And I think that was. Um, and I've no doubt that he ran a seriously 21st century, predominantly digital program of interference, which amplified the Trump candidacy fed the hothouse conspiracy frenzy online, a constant state of destabilized perception, and timely and judicious doses of WikiLeaks leaks which drained Hillary's bona fides and her turnout and motivated Trump's. What we have witnessed is something remarkable and noteworthy. Putin has proven himself an information master, and his adversaries are his information victims. Tass quotes Kissinger saying Putin is a cold calculator of Russia's national interest. David Remnick in the New Yorker says the president-elect acts in ways that leave even dystopian satire behind. Trump, of course, tweeted, China has stolen the US Navy drone and taken it to China. And he said, it, 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 he said it saying unprecedented, he said, he said unprecedented, as in president. ED, UN at the front. Um, it took Trump and his team 87 minutes to fix the word unprecedented. Why the typo matters, it suggests the tweet was not vetted or done in consultation with any advisors, important point. A takeaway from Bannon's films, the arc of the moral universe may be long, but it bends towards the guillotine. And according to another report of the New York Post, the only phone call Donald Trump always takes is Ivanka Trump's. And she, of course, is moving to a first lady role at the White House. International markets, it was a strong year for stocks, commodities, and the dollar. Take a look at this league table. Currency markets, euro dollar 10461, dollar index 10254. Japanese yen 11732, Swiss franc 10243. The Australian dollar, 0.7296. Um, India rupee, 67.755. South Korean one, 1184.96. The real, 339.30. Egyptian pounds, sort of stabilizing. Looks cheap, 18.3775. And the South African rand, 13.9704. Dollar index, I'll put up a one year chart. As, as I have been for a while, I'm looking for 110. Euro dollar, I'll put up a one year chart. I think you sell it hard with a 106 stop. I did say 105.70 previously, give yourself some room, but I think it's going to parity. The yen has not been this volatile since 1998, according to Bloomberg. 
and uh, have a look at this chart and then have a look at this one, a year of tipping points for Japanese markets via Garfield. Gold put up a six-month chart, it's last trading at 11.40. I think it's a big sell and I think we're going to see triple-digit gold next year. OPEC deal makes investors most bullish since the slump began. Most optimistic on oil since the slump began two and a half years ago. Uh, money managers have loaded up on the long side of the market. That's always a recipe for a problem. They're looking for higher prices and therefore their fortunes are closely linked to the rate of compliance to these production cuts. Crude oil, let me put up a one-year chart. I put out a rather bold call about WTI on the 28th of November when I said I did not see WTI trading above $60 under any circumstances in 2017. Aurelia base metals have come a long way, indeed they have. Sub-Saharan Africa, CCTV Africa, Ugandan President Kaguta Museveni received the Egyptian President Fateh al-Sisi for a one-day official visit. The intimidation did not work, said Ben Suda. At the end, no one feared anything. This is in the Gambia, following the five-year Bar Association meeting, dozens of lawyers stood on the tile steps of the resort's meeting room at dusk and accused Jame of treason for refusing to step down. Just a few onlookers were present, but the statement prompted an unprecedented cascade of similar denunciations. The next day, the Gambia Teachers Union called Jame's refusal to leave office a recipe for chaos and disorder, which undoubtedly endangers the lives of all Gambians. A Belgian military plane was not allowed to land in the DR Congo. Uh, this is now the deadline date today. Congo's leader trapped in a labyrinth of his own makings is Geoffrey Gettleman. In a mansion along the Congo River with a collection of expensive watches, expensive motorcycles and a chimpanzee in a cage, Joseph Kabila, the president of this vast and troubled country, should be packing up. Instead, he is digging in. It shows no signs of leaving. But the paradox is that Mr. Kabila may not especially want to stay in power. Instead, former confidant say it. He refuses to give up for a simple reason. He is afraid for his family, for his safety, and not insignificant for his wealth. He doesn't have an exit plan, said Martin Fuyulu, an opposition politician. It is an old problem with a new twist. In a sense, Mr. Kabila is trapped, as Jason Stans says he's in a labyrinth of his own making, and cornered he has begun to lash out. Several people who know the president well said Mr. Kabila was increasingly isolated, moody and antisocial. They said he'd been keeping irregular hours, becoming ir irritable with his staff members, and staying up late to play Sony PlayStation 4 or race his fancy motorcycles up and down the dark boulevards of Kinshasa to blow off steam. A former colleague said he sometimes wore two expensive watches at the same time, a Rolex and a Patek Philippe, one for each wrist. Mr. Stearns, that's what makes this so difficult and volatile. My best guess is we're headed into turmoil for several years to come. I wrote about this on the 12th of December when I described him as the biker president sitting in the presidential palace in Kinshasa, and I said he's actually hanging on by his fingertips. I put up a photograph of the dead streets of Kinshasa that Trezo underscore K tweeted. Uh, and then Reuters World, Congo's Kabila faces test on streets as his term expires. That took me back to speed in politics. The revolutionary contingent attains its ideal form not in the place of production, but in the street, where for a moment it stops being a cog in the technical machine and itself becomes a motor, a machine of attack. In other words, a producer of speed. As we look around the world today, we can see a battle for the street, as we see it in Kinshasa today. And I said, we need to ask ourselves how many can an incumbent shoot stone coal dead? A hundred, thousand, ten thousand. I said, this is another point. There is a threshold beyond which the incumbent cannot go. Where that threshold lies will be discovered in the throes of the event. 
And then I go back to comments that I, that I picked up when I was writing this, which was May 2015. There is an internationalization of African youth who are dreaming and thinking in the same way. They cannot imprison, imprison hope. They will fail. Youth will continue to mobilize. We are prepared to take to the streets to chase out Kabila, said Diego Katz, 29 years old, who is unemployed. Kabila will be an illegal president. I don't know how Kabila is going to stay on because we don't like him anymore. We are not his tenants. Congo is our country. South African oil shares down 1.98% this year, below 50,000 again. Dollar Rand, 13.9704. Uh, Interesting story about Standard Bank, for sort of trying to force the president to cease and desist with his interference around the Guptas. And I think, you know, if the court rules in their favor, it's quite a big moment. A bullish one. Egyptian pound versus the dollar, that's at 18.3775. Nigerian all share down 6.76% this year. Ghana stock exchange composite index down 20.84% this year. South African Global Credit Ratings GCR downgraded NACUMAC long term rating to BB minus from BB. The rating downgrade reflects the notable deterioration in NACUMAC's credit risk profile. Growth of the business has been highly leveraged with the ever-growing working capital and capex requirements having been largely funded through short-term debt, said GCI in the credit report. The rating agency noted that Nakamat debt and burden had quadrupled in the last four years to 18 billion shillings, up from 4.7 billion in 2012, placing unduly high pressure on the group's gearing and liquidity position with funding limits having largely been breached. Retail chain is majority owned by the Shah family, 92.3%. The balance is owned by Hotnet Limited, a company associated with the businessman John Haroon Moal. Mr. Moal is reported to have sold a 7.7% stake in the retailer last month. This was a big stumbling block to doing any more financing. Mr. Mao has proven a challenge because of this. He was born in 1948 to a humble family. Read this report at corrective.org. By the 1990s, he was a rich man. Two decades later, he is richer still. Last year, the Mao family was named in the 2014 Wealth in Kenya report as one of the richest in the country. The US government is currently seeking to confiscate $750 million he has invested there. In 2011, Obama's administration blacklisted him in the Kingpin Act. Put up a photograph of Haroon, Haroon Wao, Esquire. Sassini Tea and Coffee issued a profits warning. Drop in profits was primarily occasioned by the fact that the financial statements for the year ended 30th September 2015 included a significant one off net capital gain related to the disposal of land. The board approved the payment of a second interim dividend of one shilling and twenty-five cents to be paid on the thirty-first of January. Look at the link for the share price data. Kenya shilling last trading one hundred two point two four five. Nairobi all share down ten point two two percent this year at a fourteen-week closing left. NSE twenty, which fell zero point seven nine percent Friday, is down twenty-three point one six percent and has closed at a multi-year low. Every listed share can be interrogated via the link, which is the second from last link on rich wrap-ups, and NSC listed Atlas and yet another fundraiser. That is the triumph of hope over reality. Once again, thank you for stopping by, and uh, very much looking forward to Christmas holidays, as I'm sure you all are too.